going to read from Romans chapter 8, and our key verses are going to be verses 9 through 21. We're going to look at the context. You've heard this verse many times. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard it out of context, or you were given the proper understanding and interpretation, but we're going to go through the context and show you what it means. And it's a very powerful thought that God gives to us in Romans 8. And Romans 8, everybody talks about the book of Romans and they go to Romans 8. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And they don't realize that you have to understand chapter 6 and chapter 7 before you get to the context of chapter 8 to know what chapter 8 is talking about. It's actually talking about a very powerful victory. It, it talks about walking after the flesh and walking after the spirit. And those terms are greatly misunderstood. Um, some people think, for example, before we get into it and read it, that if you murder, if you lie, if you steal, if you commit adultery, you're, you're walking after the flesh. Well, we're going to show you that you can be very religious and not do any of those things I just described and be walking after the flesh, actually in the way Paul was really talking about. Yes, those sinful things are obviously walks in the flesh, but that's not what Paul was talking about. When you read Romans 8, the things he was talking about by walking after the flesh is ways in which people try to serve God incorrectly. And so I'm going to show that. I'm going to prove it to you, but also give you the understanding of just like Israel had a goal in mind, and their goal was to reach that land of Canaan, come out of Egypt and, and find their own promised land, and that was a goal of all goals to Israel. In fact, having their own land to this day is such a huge thing. Imagine what it was like way back when it all began, when Moses led them through the exodus to Israel, the promised land. Well, our goal is coming to this place in God that Romans is talking about, where we have real kingdom victory. Victory to Israel would have been getting out of bondage, ruling in their own land. I mean, you couldn't get any further away from slavery than coming into a promised land and having it your own land to rule. <clears throat> well, by the same token, there's no more victory in the Christian life than the kingdom victory of coming towards that place where we have victory over sin, over sickness, over disease, over devils, over Satan, over the world. But the greatest victory we're going to have is over our own flesh. And I say that's the greatest because that's our greatest enemy. So look at Romans 8, verse 19 and 20. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature, now first of all, creation's waiting, waiting to see the sons of God manifested. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So notice that they're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God because they're going to be delivered into the liberty of the children of God. So what is this liberty of the children of God? What is this manifestation of the sons of God that creation's waiting for? Um, now I will say there's been a lot of wild speculation about this and some bizarre doctrines, but again, this is my interpretation. I, I am conscious of needing God to lead me in my prayer and study. So I'm not saying believe what I'm going to say just because I'm saying it. Um, I'm saying look for yourself. I think you'll get a witness in the spirit of what we're talking about. But what is it when it talks about the manifestations of the sons of God? And what is it that creation is going to be delivered from bondage into the liberty of the children of God? First of all, go to Romans 6. Romans 6 taught us that our deaths with Jesus bring us into a newness of life or a resurrection life. Look in Romans 6, verses 3 to 4. Know ye not, and this is why I'm so strong with baptism, because look what it says about baptism in Romans 6 and 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ? It's not saying everybody. It's only so many of us as were baptized into Jesus are going to be able to enjoy what he's going to say here were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Just like they buried Jesus 2,000 years ago, 
We're buried with him. We make that part of our experience when we're baptized into his death. That like, and here's the purpose. Why? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. In other words, after he was buried, he rose from the dead. You can't rise from the dead unless you're dead and buried first. And he walked in a physical resurrection life. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So it's comparing a new life, a new existence with Jesus Christ resurrecting from the grave. And we're able to enjoy that because we're joined to his death when we're baptized into it for the purpose of us being able to walk in this newness of life afterwards. So when we read from verses 1 to 11 in Romans 6, and the core of it is what we just read in these couple verses, verses 3 and 4, it says we're to get an understanding. He keeps repeating the thought, know ye not, don't you know? And a lot of Christians today still don't know, although this was explained 2,000 years ago. They don't know that we actually died with Jesus, spiritually speaking. Now, just because it's not physical doesn't mean it's, act, it's not actual. We actually died with him, and God sees it like that. And Paul is trying to say you need to see yourselves in that light as well. You were baptized into his death, and verse 11 says, Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God now. You, you have risen from the dead with Christ. If you read verses 9 and 10, before you get to verse 11, look at it while I'm talking. Romans is saying, Paul is writing, Like Jesus died once and is now alive unto God, he lives unto God. Reckon yourselves indeed to be dead and reckon yourself dead unto sin as well and alive unto God. Likewise, take exactly what is said about Jesus, reckon it for yourself. It's likewise, it's identical. So we're alive to God, and it says it's through Jesus. I can't say I'm just alive from the dead without saying through Christ, because that would mean I've had to have physically died and resurrected. But because Christ died and rose again, and I was baptized into that death, through Christ I resurrected and am now alive unto God. So you've got to understand it's through Jesus. Now look at it again, verse 10 and 11 of Romans 6, for in that he died... He died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, in other words, as far as living goes with Christ, he lives unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. It took the very two things it said about Jesus, dead to sin and alive unto God, and said them about us. We're dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the very next verse says, so don't let sin rule in your mortal bodies. Now here's where we get into victory. Here's where we get into whether a person is really a victorious Christian or they're a weak and stumbling Christian. Does sin have victory? It says don't let that happen. Don't let it rule. And when it says let not sin therefore rule in your mortal body, it's attributing it to the fact that you're supposed to be dead to sin. So don't let sin rule. You're supposed to be dead to sin and alive unto God, not dead to God and alive unto sin. So now that you know you're alive unto God through Christ, don't let sin rule in your mortal body anymore. And the fact of the matter is positionally, all of us, you and I, if you've been baptized into Christ's death, we're dead to sin. We are. But sin might still be having dominance over us because we don't understand what Paul was teaching. And so many Christians, they're just concerned about getting to heaven and getting out of hell, let alone this stuff. But these things are important in the here and now. This is going to give you victory now. Sure, we're going to have a wonderful time after this life is over. In glory, uh, we're going to have eternal bodies and, and immortal spiritual bodies and so forth. But while our bodies are mortal, it didn't say don't let sin rule in your immortal bodies when you get to heaven. That's redundant. That goes without saying it's a moot issue. Of course we won't have sin ruling in our immortal bodies. But for him to say don't let it rule in your mortal bodies, speaking of right now, that's another thing altogether. And we have to stop putting all our victory over into heaven because according to this verse, right now while we still have mortal bodies, 
Sin doesn't have to rule over us. We can be ruling over it. And this is what it means to be a kingdom-oriented Christian, a kingdom believer. Now we've got dominion. And it's over our own bodies with the lust. It says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. How many of us give in to our lusts, are defeated by our lusts all the time? Uh, a verse is coming to me now that mirrors the same thing in Galatians chapter 5. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the lusts thereof. The flesh and its lusts. In another place, Paul said, I'm crucified to the world and the world's crucified to me. That meant the world had no hold on him anymore. Too many believers have a hold from the world on their lives. And they're struggling all the time. They really can't get with it. And if you're like that, it's probably because, first of all, you didn't know you could have this kind of victory. And even if you imagine victory, I wish I could have victory over these lusts. I wish I could have victory against the temptations of the world. You didn't know how to attain it. But Romans is telling us how. And I'm going to explain that as we continue. So after verse 12 says you're dead to sin, so don't let it rule in your mortal bodies anymore. What's the first thing verse 13 says? Neither yield ye your members. So number one, verse 12 says, don't let sin rule in your mortal bodies. And then verse 13, the second point says, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Now notice, let not sin rule, yield not your members. It's really telling us we've had a choice in this. We could have let it or not let it. We could have yielded or not yielded. But we didn't know that because a lot of us didn't even know we were baptized into Jesus' death to be able to say, hey, I'm dead to sin now. Through Christ, I'm dead to sin and I'm alive to God. And if somebody says, well, you didn't die and resurrect, what do you mean you're dead and now you're alive again from the dead? Through Christ, I died to sin. And through Christ, I'm alive unto God. And it's so powerful. It's not just a story. It's not just an imagination. Just picture yourself like that. It's so true that it comes out into the practical life and living where it says now, since that's true, don't let sin rule in your mortal body. In other words, it's practically applicable to you. You can physically see victory over your lusts. Whereas you would normally give in to these temptations and these lusts, you have victory over that now. So it's not just automatic though. Paul wouldn't say, don't you know? You need to know this. You need to reckon this. You need to comprehend it. In other words, apply it to yourself. He wouldn't say that if it was just automatic. And most Christians seem to think that, well, this doesn't work. I thought I'd have all this peace, joy, and victory since I got saved. And this tempts me and that tempts me. And I slip and fall. And I say this and I say that. And I hurt people. And so they think, well, it's just an elusive victory. And we'll have to wait till we die and go to heaven to get free from this stuff. That's what most people think. But Paul says, no, it's not automatic. You do have to learn some things. And next, you need to find out what your part is to play. It's not automatic. You've got a part to play too. But it all begins with knowing it first. And we'll tell you what your part is here in a second. But after he says in verse 12, don't let sin rule. And verse 13, don't give your members of your body. It's talking about the members of your body, your hands, your feet, your tongue. Some people say things they should never be saying. They hurt, they broke, they, they, they cut, they break. Uh, a wounded spirit, who can bear? You know, they say sticks and stones can break our bones, but words will never hurt. That's a bunch of lies. Yes, you can hurt with your words. And too many people don't have victory over their tongues. They yield their tongues as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But here's the key. But yield yourselves, number one, unto God. How? When you go to see somebody important, you're going to dress up your best. You're going to present yourself the best way you can present yourself if you really respect and admire this person. Well, we're talking about presenting ourselves to God. And you know the best way you can present yourself to God as is not, oh, hey, God, by the way, I read the Bible 15 times, front, front to back. I know more commandments. I know more verses. I know more scriptures. I've memorized the whole book of Matthew. No, present yourself to God the way he sees you. So he gets the fact that you get it as those alive from the dead. 
you respect the work of the cross so much, you believe in it so much, you understand it like Paul recommended for you to know when he said, know ye not, that now that you know this, you present yourself to God, I'm alive from the dead, God. I believe exactly what your word said about me. And number two, your members, present your members as instruments of his righteousness. That means an instrument is something he takes and uses in his hand. Well, while we've been trying to serve God so successfully and failing and stumbling and doing our best and getting falling into temptations, we haven't been giving him. We never even thought of it. Take my hands. If you don't take my hands and do something with it, sin is. So I'm putting my hands into your hands as your instruments. And if they're your instruments, then you're going to use me. And believe God's going to do that when you pray. Pray what you, believe what you pray for will come to pass. Take my hands, use them today. Take my tongue. Sin has been taking my tongue and using it so much of a, as a, an instrument of unrighteousness unto sin. God, you take my tongue. You use it. One man walked into a train. This was written years ago by this awesome Christian author. And he says there's three men in this cable, this train car, playing cards, gambling. And they needed a fourth man. And they said, uh, can you join us? We need a fourth hand. He said, I'm sorry, I would, but my hands aren't with me today. And they looked at his hands. They looked at him and then looked at his hands again and said, this is weird. And he got to explain to them the gospel, how he was bought with a price. His body and his spirit are now the possession of the Lord. You read that in 1 Corinthians 6. And he has given his hands to God for instruments of righteousness, not to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. And he told them the whole gospel. And this is the verse he based it upon. You see, the bodily aspect of our lives, the practical way we behave as Christians, when we're not in church raising our hands and shouting, when we're living in everyday life, how you treat people, how you talk to people, what you say about them to other people. That's the way we live and the way we act. And Paul is saying, you need to give your bodies to God. First, present yourself to God as somebody alive from the dead. Then, now present each member of your body for him to use. And by mentioning that our physical bodies must be presented to God, Paul is getting concerned with how we behave in this world. It's high time that Christians get concerned about how they behave and how they treat people. This is the first sermon I've preached in 2015, and this is an awesome thing to start the year with. Get concerned about how you treat people and how you live, what your tongue says, what your mouth says, what your hands do, where your feet take you. Creation is waiting for it. Now we're leading up to the original scripture I opened up with in Romans 8. Creation's waiting for the manifestation. Creation's waiting to be delivered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This is the liberty it's talking about. This is the liberty. Romans 7 shows us how Paul learned Romans 6. He takes us through a walkthrough of his personal experience where he said, I struggled, I wanted to do good, and I was trying my best, and I just couldn't do it, and I was doing all kinds of evil instead. You read that about the middle of Romans 7 down to the end. And he introduces the difference in verse 6, Romans 7 and 6. But now we are delivered from the law. Now, remember in Romans 8, he talked about creation itself shall be delivered from bondage into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Deliverance is a key issue here. Before it says creation is going to be delivered, it says we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And then Paul goes on to talk about how wanting to do good and keeping the law of the Old Testament and not being able to do it was unsuccessful, but it was serving God by the oldness of the letter, going by the book literally, the letter. There's no spirit involved. There's no Romans 6 and 13 involved. God I'm giving you my hands. I'm giving you the members of my body. I'm alive from the dead. And by the way, I know what being alive from the dead means because 
Romans 6 and 7 says, he that is dead is freed from sin. And I know I've died to sin and now I'm alive unto you and I'm freed and I'm delivered. So I want you now. Sin doesn't have to use my hands anymore. I've got a choice. And you might not have even known you've had a choice. Oh, well, I'm stuck with this old temptation and giving into it that I've always given into. But you're not stuck to it. When you know you're dead with Christ and you're alive from the dead and he that is dead is freed from sin, you can say, God, I'm alive from the dead. I'm freed from sin. Sin doesn't have to use my hands anymore. I'm giving them to you to use. I didn't know I had this choice before. And if all you do is keep trying your best and never giving your members as instruments for God to use, well, you will continue to fail because you weren't built to do this on your own. You were built to rely on the Spirit. And so we were delivered from the law so that we don't have to go by the oldness of the letter. We've got the newness of the Spirit now. And what's that mean? It means Romans 6 and 13. You can go to God's Spirit and say, here, use my hands, use my mouth, use my feet as your instruments because I'm alive from the dead. And that means I'm useful to you. When you're alive from the dead, you're useful to God. He can't use somebody alive that's not alive from the dead, that's still in their dead in their sins and trespasses. You have to be alive from the dead. That's why Romans 6 and 3 starts this whole picture out by saying we've been baptized into Jesus' death, and now we're walking in newness of life. Yes, there's a spiritual resurrection before a physical one ever comes at the last trumpet. The spiritual resurrection is when you're dead to sin and alive unto God and now you're presenting yourself to God as those that are alive from the dead. What's life from the dead? Isn't that resurrection? And Paul says, present yourself like that now. He didn't say, wait till the trumpet sounds, wait till you come out of the grave and then say, hey God, I'm alive from the dead. That's physical. But now we're spiritually alive from the dead. I mean, it has to be spiritual because I died with Jesus. That, that wasn't physical. Spiritually I did. And likewise, spiritually, I'm alive from the dead. And verse 11 of Romans 6 says, I need to reckon myself alive from the dead. And, and uh, alive unto God and dead to sin. And so, then Paul said in Romans 7 and 15, For that which I do, I allow not. The things I'm doing, I don't want to be doing them. What I would, the things I want to do, I'm not doing it. But what I hate, that's what I'm doing. Paul was bound. And you know, a lot of Christians are bound like that. They are not free. They're bound by a lot of these things. Technically, they are free. According to the Word of God, they're free. But it's not coming into the practical for them. Moving from our spiritual position into our practical behavior, this study is required for us to be able to experience that. And so, verses 15 to 21 of Romans 7 describes this crazy struggle. If I then do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now he's talking about living by the law here. Now then it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. He said, if I'm wanting to do good and I'm not doing it, it's not me, it's not my want to that's wrong. That's great. I consent the law that it's good. But sin inside me is making me do these things. For I know that, in, that that's where sin is ruling in your mortal body in chapter 7 and 12, or 6 and 12 rather. Don't let sin rule in your body. And Paul goes on to describe what that's like in chapter 7. So what you're reading in Romans 7, 15 to 21 is what Romans 6 and 12 talked about you're not supposed to be doing. Now Some people think Paul had this battle. He, he had that battle once, but when he wrote this, he was freed from it. And he's walking us through what it's like so then he can explain how to get out of it because he wasn't in it when he wrote this contrary to what you'll hear a lot of people say he discovered sin was dwelling in him for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me I've got the will I want to do what God's law says uh, but he's describing what it's like serving God in the oldness of the letter and it can't work and he's proving how it does, why it doesn't work to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find it. He just said the law is good. But how to perform that which is good, I, I don't have it in me. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It's no more I that do it. But sin, if I'm doing things that I don't want to do, it's sin inside me that's doing it. 
I find then a law that when I would do good, evil's present with me. Notice he didn't say when I present myself to God as alive from the dead, evil's present with me. Notice he didn't say when I render to God my members as instruments of his righteousness, that sin is present with me. No, when I would do good, when I take the law that is good, nothing wrong with the law, and try to make myself obey it. I've got the will that's present with me, but how to perform it, I don't have it. I don't have the ability. I don't have the performance. That is serving an oldness of the letter. But serving in the newness of the Spirit is what I described, or what Paul described in Romans 6 and 13. Here I am, God. I'm alive from the dead. I finally get it. And here's my hands as instruments of your righteousness now. I need your Spirit to work with me. We're laborers together with Him. That's why it's not automatic, and that's why, unfortunately, a lot of Christians are blowing it. They don't have the presentation part under their belts. I'm presenting myself alive to God. How can you present yourself alive to God? You know you're freed from sin. If you don't know these things, so you, that's why he said, first you have to know it. And then in chapter, or chapter 6, verse 11, then you have to reckon it. You've got to realize it. Make it real. Realize it. And then in verse 13, now do something about it. Okay, God, I realize it now. First I knew it. I learned it. Then I realized it. And now I'm presenting myself to you. Everybody remember these three words from Romans 6. Know, reckon, and yield. Know, reckon, and yield. Know your life from the dead. Reckon yourself to be alive from the dead. Apply it to you now. And now yield yourself as alive from the dead. Do something. Bring again into the practical. And so Paul was describing bondage. And in Romans 7 and 24... He was so frustrated, he described it by looking back. Now remember, he's only looking back. He's not in this state of defeat when he wrote this. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Now remember Romans 6, we've been delivered, rather chapter 7, verse 6, we've been delivered from the law. So here he goes, he states that as a fact, we're delivered. We don't have to serve in the oldness of the letter. We serve in the newness of the spirit. But he says, let me walk you through my time before I realize that. I cried out for this deliverance that I now know and I now realize and appreciate. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? And then he gives the answer to his own question. I thank God. God will. See, we're trying to deliver ourselves by making ourselves. When I would do good, I'm going to make myself do good. I'm using my willpower. I don't know anything about calling on God's spirit. All I know is using my willpower. But to will is present with me. And how to perform that which is good, I don't find it. So I need deliverance. I need some help. I can't do good on my own. When I would do good, evil's present with me. Now, God, I need help. Deliver me. And then he said, how did God do it? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I thank God, <coughs> excuse me, through Jesus Christ. Now, you know what that means? <laughs> There's where he learned Romans 6. I'm dead to sin through Jesus. I'm alive unto God through Jesus. So when I finally cried out to God for deliverance, I said, who will deliver me? <coughs> Excuse me. God did through Jesus. And that's how I learned, folks, what Romans chapter 6 says. <coughs> Excuse me, I got tickle in my throat. <coughs> and so, Romans 8 now gets into the picture. Before we get into Romans 8, read the last. You're supposed to keep reading from chapter 7 into chapter 8, undisturbed, unbroken, uninterrupted. I thank God. Thank God for what? For delivering us through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and then he summarizes what he just said in chapter 7. So then with the mind, in other words, the will, to will is present with me. So with the mind, I'm serving the law of God. God looks at my mind. <coughs> and he sees everything out it is as it should be. That's because I'm willing to do his law. So with the mind, I'm serving the law of God. But with the flesh, when it comes to actually doing it, I'm not. I'm serving the law of sin and death. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In order to understand that verse, everybody cuts verse 1 off from chapter 7 to 25, and they totally miss it. In order to understand 8 and 1, you've got to keep reading what the flesh is 
in verse seven and twenty or verse twenty five. I'm serving God with my mind, but with my flesh, I'm serving the law of sin and death. So I'm not going to walk after that flesh anymore. I'm not going to try serving God with my flesh anymore. I'm going to serve God by walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh, because walking after that flesh, I was only serving the law of sin and death with the flesh. My mind served the law of God, but my flesh was serving the law of sin and death. So I'm not going to walk after that flesh. I'm not going that route to serve God, the oldness of the letter, because that's what the oldness of the letter was. Thou shalt not. <coughs> Excuse me. You had to make yourself not. Thou shalt not. But Romans 6 and 13 is a totally different approach. It's not thou shalt not. It's God, deliver me. I need your help. Here's my hands. Here's my mouth. I need your spirit to empower me. I need, I'm walking after the spirit now. I'm le leaning on your spirit. I used to walk after my flesh by always trying to do good and never being able to do it. So it doesn't work. And I was getting so much condemnation. The, the chapter 7, verse 15 to 21 that he described was condemnation. That's the condemnation that Romans 8 and 1 is talking about. It's not talking about the condemnation of hell, condemnation of being lost as a sinner. He's talking about Christians that walk after the flesh. Well, you're not a Christian if you walk after flesh. That's not true. Walking after the flesh, like I said, is trying to serve God in the oldness of the letter. It's, it's using willpower. It's not even conceiving the idea that what if I relied on God and asked him to cause me to keep his statutes? Because Ezekiel and Jeremiah both described the new covenant. God would give us his spirit and put his spirit in us to cause us to walk after his statutes. And he said, this is the whole difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. He said, I'm not giving you a covenant that I gave Israel when they came out of Egypt and, and went to that mountain and gave them the law. I'm going to put my law in your hearts. I'm going to put my spirit in you and cause you to walk after my statutes. And that's where Romans 6 and 13 comes in. We have God's spirit. So believe upon him, talk to him and ask him. Say, I'm alive from the dead, Lord. Here I am use my hands. I don't want sin to rule in my mortal body anymore. I want your spirit to quicken my mortal body. And by the way, that's what Romans 8 was talking about when it said, if the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, it quickens your mortal body as opposed to chapter 6 verse 12, sin ruling in your mortal body. It's not talking about when our bodies physically come out of the graves. And we'll show you that verse because the verse is right after that in Romans 8, somewhere around verse 10 and 11, proves that's not talking about the physical resurrection. That's the spirit that raised up Jesus will quicken us while we're still in our mortal bodies where sin could otherwise rule and it causes us to have victory over the lusts that our hands would normally fulfill, that our mouths would normally fulfill and yield to. Hurting and cutting and lying and, and backbiting and doing things behind people's backs. Sin does that, folks. We ought to make this year a year where I'm going to grow up spiritually. I'm going to get victory over these things because if the cross provided the way for me to have the victory, then bless God, I'm going to have the victory. I'm going to learn this, what he's talking about here in Romans 6, 7, and 8. And so, because the flesh can't be made to serve the law of God, even though your mind is all okay, then stop walking after that flesh. So look at Romans 8 verse 1 in conjunction with 7 and 25 and connect the words flesh in both verses since I'm serving God the law of sin and death with the flesh therefore I'm not going to walk after that flesh anymore I'm walking after the spirit and now he gets into the truth that Romans 6 and 13 introduced chapter 8 details presenting yourself it explains how you do that how you readjust your thinking how you uh, uh, change the way you work in your mind and your flesh and your bodily members comes into play from chapter 6 verse 13 and so when you present yourself as alive from the dead that means I don't have to be living in this bondage <coughs> I don't have to be living in this bondage sinning and never getting victory like some people say that's just you'll have to live with it until the Lord comes no we don't Presenting yourself to God as somebody who is alive from the dead 
is presenting yourself to God with a full understanding that I know I died with him. And what that means is I'm resurrected with Christ to serve the living God. And now I expect to live in newness of life. I've presented myself to God. I prayed. And now I expect it to happen throughout the rest of this day. And you believe what you prayed for will come to pass. And God needs that faith. See, this is another reason why so many Christians blunder. Is they don't think to pray like this. God, I got a problem with my mouth. Take it as your instrument this day. Remember, pray this daily. This day. Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord's Prayer. You got to pray like this every day. And I'm going to believe for you to do it. I'm going to believe for you to lead my feet into certain places. Even while I'm on the job, certain circumstances will arise where I'll, where I'll build a witness for you. Tell somebody about Jesus. I'm giving you my hands. I'm giving you my body. I'm alive from the dead, God. I don't know why I never thought about praying like this before. I guess I needed a preacher to tell me. You see, the things I'm telling you now, you'd never know unless you had a preacher read and teach from the Word of God. And so this is the works of the cross bringing it into practical living. And so, let me touch on Romans 6 again just quickly. Romans 6 and 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you. After it says, verse 13, Yield yourself to God now. Give the members of your body as instruments to Him. It says, Because sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. They couldn't do this under law. You're under grace. You're not in the oldness of the letter. You're in the newness of the spirit. This is an entirely different covenant now. What then shall we sin? See, everybody thinks, oh, well, I'm not under law. That means I can sin. And Paul knew we'd say, think that. So he said, what shall we sin? Because we're not under law, but under grace. God forbid. Don't you know that the people who yield themselves as servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. It's, it's a matter of yielding. If you don't yield to sin, you're not going to sin. So he said, don't think that we can sin now because we're not under law. You, you think that because we don't have a rule book to live by, that means we can live any way we want? No, there's another route to live for God other than going by a rule book than the oldness of the letter. It's the newness of the Spirit. And the Spirit is going to cause you to live in ways. The law won't say anything against it. I tried to get you to live that way, and I couldn't do it. And that's why Romans 8 says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak because of our flesh. See, remember flesh? I can't serve God with his flesh. I just serve the law of sin and death. And in my flesh, there's no good thing. Sin's in my flesh. When I would do good, evil's present with me. Romans 7 and 21. Romans 7 and 25. With the flesh, I serve the law of sin. So, don't walk after that flesh anymore. The law was weak because of the flesh. So if we had no sin in our flesh, there would have been no problem keeping the law. We could use willpower successfully. But the performance will never be there when you use willpower because sin is stronger than your willpower. Now point that down. Write that down. Sin is stronger than your willpower. So don't walk after the flesh anymore. Walk after the spirit. And it says... Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness, but God be thanked. Now isn't that what he said in Romans 7 and 25? But thank God. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. You were screaming out like Paul did, who will deliver me? But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So if you're a servant of righteousness, getting back to the hypothetical question, can we sin because we're not under law? Of course not. You're servants of God now. Do you think God's going to cause you? You see, we're thinking so independently. Well, if I don't make myself do good, I'm going to do bad. No. you got to think non-independently. you got to think he's the one causing this. Just like sin... You never thought of it before, but you were actually saying, well, sin, here, take my hands and use them. Whenever you tried to make yourself do right, you might as well just say, take my hands and use them, sin, because willpower is not stronger than that sin power that's in your flesh. If you don't render yourself to God as alive from the dead, and you don't give your bodies to him, bodily members, as instruments of righteousness, sin's going to use them. Sin will use them. You don't need to pray for sin to use them. It's just going to. But you do need to pray for God to use you or it won't happen. See, this is where you have to start having faith now. 
not just willpower. By the way, when I say willpower doesn't cut it, I don't mean cancel willpower out. You still have to have the will. But you're working with God's spirit now. He's empowering you. And that's a totally different story. So now ch go to chapter 8. We're leading up to this. Verse 3, for what the law could not do. Oh, by the way, look at verse 2. I don't want to skip verse 2. Romans 8 and 2. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 6 and 13. Not many know this, but that is qualifying yourself for the law of the spirit of life to work. There's some qualifications you have to fall under if you're going to have success. It's just not going to be automatic. Well, I'm saved. It should be automatic. No. You have to yield yourself. You have to know. You have to acknowledge everything Romans 6 said about you and Christ's death to be true. And God needs that faith or he can't help you. And when he sees you exerting that faith, consciously having that faith, I'm alive from the dead. Then you go, aha, I'm alive from the dead. I don't need to have this defeat in me anymore. I'm alive from the dead. Sin shall not have dominion over me. Did it have dominion over Christ when he resurrected from the dead? No. Then why should it be to me? But you don't come to those kind of conclusions and those revelations until you first learn it. And then after you learn it, the reckoning part is the getting it part. I get it. I'm dead indeed unto sin, but I'm alive unto God through Christ. That's the whole key. It's through Christ this is so. And so when you present yourself like to God like that in that kind of revelation, that frame of spirit, I was going to say frame of mind, but it's the frame of spirit, then my, your faith is powerful at that point. And, and God's going to do it. God's going to do it. And then he says, it will happen. The law of the spirit of life kicks into effect now. And it makes you free from the law of sin and death. Whereas the law of sin and death said, you try serving God with fleshly willpower only, and I emphasize the only, you're going to fail. That's the law of sin and death. When you would do good, evil's always going to be present with you. But God says, no, you walk after my spirit. You present yourself to my spirit as alive from the dead and give my spirit your hands, your feet as instruments for me to use and I will cause you. I will empower you and you'll be a labor together with me. And my law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will make you free from that condemning law of sin and death that nails you every time you try to do good and you find out that evil's present instead. Romans 7, 21. For what the law could not do, verse 3, and that it was weak through the flesh, trying to live for God in the oldness of the letter, through the flesh, it can't work. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Sin was in Paul's flesh. He said, God condemned that sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In other words, the righteousness that law tried to put within us, but couldn't because it was weak through the flesh. God dealt with that sin that was in our flesh so that that same righteousness could be fulfilled. In other words, the victory that law tried to get us to achieve through making ourselves in willpower to stop doing bad it's achieved by another avenue than willpower to make ourselves stop doing sin. It's by this presentation. It's by this walking after the Spirit. It's getting God on the scene, getting His power working in us. And that fulfills the very righteousness. See, First Timothy tells us, the law tried to have you unfeigned faith. It tried to put in you, I think it's in First Timothy 1 and 4, real love, real charity, and unfeigned faith, and righteousness but the law could not do it but in the same chapter and I think it's verse 14 Paul said grace was full of what the law tried to get he said the law is not against Christ and Christ isn't against the law grace is full of the very thing law tried to instill within us it's full of faith and love and that's Romans 8 saying the same thing what the law couldn't do the righteousness it tried to put in us Grace puts it in us, but we're not consulting law and making ourselves obey it to achieve that. We're, we're just relying on God's spirit. And when you give yourself as a servant of God for him to work through you, he's not going to work through you anything that's going to disagree with his own law. It's just that the avenue and the means of using law, forcing people's willpower to act, it doesn't work. But he achieves the same end results 
by you just allowing his spirit to live through you. Praise God. Now we're getting close to where we were talking about. And so, in verse 4, Romans 8 and 4, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who don't walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. And now, verse 11. I'm going to skip down a bit. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth within you. Now I'm going to prove to you this isn't talking about our future physical resurrection, which I believe is going to happen, by the way. But this isn't talking about it. Why? Because verse 12 says, Therefore, brethren, because of what I just said, the spirit of God can quicken your mortal body. Therefore, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Now let me explain that. If that's talking about our mortal bodies being raised out of the grave and being made immortal, it wouldn't say that's going to happen so we don't have to live after the flesh. And you're not going to live after the flesh anyway. But it's telling us now that your bodies are still mortal and you still have sin in that flesh and you still are subject to all these temptations, you don't have to let sin rule in that mortal flesh. God's Spirit can quicken your mortal body so that you aren't a debtor to serve sin and fulfill the lust and live after that flesh anymore. It's talking about right now. That's why you don't have to live after the flesh because His Spirit that raised up Jesus quickens you. See, we already said we're baptized into His death and here our hearts are still beating. Physically, we're still alive, but yet we died. And by the same token, we're already alive from the dead too in Romans 6. Walking in this newness of life, the likeness of his resurrection, is us now in the mortal flesh having victory. And Romans 6 and 13 proves it. We're alive from the dead now. And so when Romans 8 and verse 11 says, the spirit quickens our mortal bodies, that's talking about this spiritual resurrection that results from Romans 6 and 13, where we say, God, take my hands, take my mouth, give me victory. Sin is in this flesh and it's going to rule me, but I'm giving it to a greater power. My willpower couldn't defeat this sin, but your spirit's power can. And so I'm giving myself to your spirit. Now quicken it and God will give you victory over those things. So you don't have to live after the flesh anymore. Now watch this, verse 13. Because if you live after the flesh... Verse, chapter 8, verse 13. You shall die. And what did Paul say in Romans 7? Sin took occasion by the commandment and killed me. When he says die here, and he says killed, it's talking about failing in your Christian life and giving in to sin all the time. He said, because if you live after the flesh, you will die. You will die the way I did, Paul said. Sin took occasion by the commandment, and by it slew me. It killed me. Look at Romans 7 and 12. Look at Romans 7, verse 11, 10, and 12. It, sin was killing him. That's the death he's talking about in Romans 8 and 13. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Living after the flesh, trying to serve God through fleshly willpower like the law said. All of Israel was living for God after the flesh. All of Israel was serving God by the oldness of the letter. And Paul said you can't carry that on into the new covenant because it didn't work then and it won't work now. That's why Jeremiah 31 and 31 says, I got a new covenant. I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm going to write my law in your heart, cause you to walk in my statutes. And so, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the spirit, mortify the deeds of the body. See, you've got to connect verse 13 to verse 11, and this again proves. Verse 11 is not talking about the physical resurrection. Through the spirit quickening your mortal bodies, you're mortifying the deeds of the body. And you'll live. How do you do that? How does the Spirit do that? You've got to give them your mortal bodies first. Here's, use them as instruments. And, and Spirit kills that power of sin in you. And it uses it instead of sin using it. Your, your hands, that is. Your mouth. Your whatever member, your body you're re, re, giving over to God. And through the Spirit, mortifying the deeds of the body is what verse 11 is saying. The Spirit will quicken your mortal body. And it's mortifying the deeds of the body, those lusts and those temptations. See, verse 10 says the body is dead because of sin and the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
You're going to either live after the body or the flesh, or you're going to live after the spirit. But if you live after the flesh or the body, you shall die. The, the body is dead because of sin. You will die. So live after the spirit by mortifying the deeds of the body through the spirit. By Romans 6 and 13, calling on God to take your hands. Calling on God to take your mortal body. So sin doesn't rule over it anymore. And verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, and here's where we're coming up to it. Here's the point. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This is what it is to be led by the Spirit. You've all heard this verse. You've all heard it. If you're led by the Spirit, you're the sons of God. But you might not have noticed the context in which it was presented. He's talking about this believing God so much for his spirit to empower you by presenting yourself to him as alive from the dead and your members as his instruments to use that you believe that that spirit quickens your mortal body and it mortifies the deeds of your body and if you're led by the spirit to that degree if the spirit you're walking after the spirit guess what that's being led by the spirit walking after the spirit is relying on him it's not relying on your fleshly willpower, your flesh. Paul said your mind can serve the law of God, but if you try using your flesh to serve God, your flesh is going to serve the law of sin and death instead. Romans 7 and 25. So do something different than that now. Do Romans 6 and 13. Present yourself to God's spirit. And that spirit will go to work. It will mortify the deeds of your body. My, I feel the presence of God just talking about it. It'll quicken your mortal body. It'll, through the spirit, you kill the deeds of the body when you were trying to do everything through willpower. You were trying to do everything through the flesh. And so, when you're led by the Spirit like that, you're walking after the Spirit when you do these things. You are a son of God. And the word son, you might say, well, I wasn't a son before that. Oh, yes, you were. But you need to know the Greek meaning of the word son here. It's in Greek, huios. And that means a mature adult. You are a mature child of God. Huios is not just a child. It's a mature child. You that are led by the Spirit. So you know what spiritual maturity is? It's not knowing all these revelations. It's not having all the gifts of the Spirit. Corinthians had all them. Paul said they're carnal. They fight. They envy one another. They're like babies. But being a mature child of God is you're getting victory over your own fleshly temptations. You're mature. Through the Spirit, you're mortifying the deeds of your flesh. Whereas your tongue was a wicked weapon in the hand of sin, you backbit, you hurt, and you brought many to tears, you've now got victory over that. You've grown up as a child of God, and He has mortified that deed through your body by the Spirit. And, and you, you're in the Spirit, but church, we need to walk after the Spirit. He says, if any man be not Christ, if you have not God's spirit, then you're none of his. And that's in chapter 8, verse 9. We have his spirit. We're his. But we're not letting that spirit work like it should. We just use it to talk in tongues every now and then. My, my, some people think all the Holy Ghost for is talk in tongues. It's to mortify the deeds of your body. That's the primary purpose that's there. While your body's still mortal. So sin in chapter 6, verse 12, doesn't rule your mortal body. And it kills you. You are a mature child of God. And verse, go down to verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the huios of God. It's waiting for manifested mature children of God. Because creation is itself under bondage. And if the Christian church is in bondage, what in the world's creation going to get any help from that church? by How, how's it going to happen they can't even deliver themselves but creation's waiting for the manifestation of sons of god so they'll be delivered they will be delivered in the freedom that we have but if we don't even have that deliverance ourselves and that freedom we aren't even mature sons of god yet we're not going to benefit creation so they're waiting for us to manifest spiritual maturity by getting victory over our own fleshly lusts. I don't know if you've ever heard Romans 8 preached like that before, but that's what he's trying to tell us from verses 10 right down to verse 19. He's waiting for us to be manifested as sons, mature sons. Christ, creation, rather, is waiting. And it says, 
we mortify the deeds of our body. And if we're led by the Spirit to that degree, we are the sons of God. So creation's waiting for us to manifest like that, to come to that kind of victory. Verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of whom who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Paul just described how Christians are so bound. They're bound by sin. You're not supposed to be servants to sin anymore. But we didn't realize it. We were yielding ourselves as servants to unrighteousness. Because, all because, we just didn't yield to God consciously instead. So if you've never thought, and if you've never prayed like this, God, I'm alive from the dead. Take my hands. Take my mouth. Take my feet, my legs. I always think of that little red devil behind the pearly white gates, the tongue. Oh, that thing can be a devil. But God, take it and use it instead. My God, you've got to deliver me from this backbiting, this gossiping, this talking, this cursing and cussing. I need deliverance from this. Deliver me. And he says, I thank God through Christ I was delivered. Then it hit me, Paul said. And I learned what I told you in chapter 6, that I'm to lean on God because I'm alive from the dead. And his spirit can use me now. I never thought of him using me. I always thought the preacher said, you, you, do, do, thou shalt not. And I never had the concept that I could yield to God and he would cause me to do this and strengthen me and empower me. And that's what creation's waiting for. That's why Romans 8 and 15 says, if you haven't received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So notice he's contrasting bondage here with the spirit. See, like I said, we always thought it was just for talking in tongues. But wow, there's so much more than that. It's the spirit of adoption. It's not bondage. God didn't give you that spirit to be bound all your life with sinning and not having any more victory than repenting over it and getting forgiven. He gave you that spirit so that through it, you mortify the deeds of the body by calling on that spirit, bringing him into the equation. My hands have done a lot of hurt, God. I'm giving them now to you as instruments of, of, of righteousness. I didn't know that if I didn't do this, I'd be just like giving them to the sin to use as instruments of unrighteousness because that's how powerful sin is over my willpower. I can't make myself. I'm not making myself anymore. I'm done with the oldness of the letter. I'm walking in the newness of the spirit now. I believe I'm raised with Christ to walk into newness of life. So this is the newness of the spirit I'm getting involved in. I'm going to call on you every day now, God. Use me. Use me. And I'm going to believe for your spirit to quicken my mortal body so that I don't obey the lusts in my flesh anymore. And, and through your spirit, mortify the deeds of the body and those that are led by the spirit in that manner. They are the sons of God. That's what it's been talking about all these years when it said, they that are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. Led by the Spirit, how? Verse 11. Mortifying the deeds of the body, quickening your mortal body so that you don't obey the lusts in your flesh anymore. You're not a debtor to the flesh to live after the flesh and its lusts anymore. Romans 8 and 12 and 8 and 13. You're living after the Spirit and God is causing those deeds to be mortified to be killed that's why it's not the spirit of bondage praise God where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty second Corinthians 3 said where the spirit of the Lord is there's liberty that's right Joanne it's God's power not our willpower praise God this some people are seeing this cut out I've got this wired up to my computer so it's directly online. It's not Wi-Fi, so your internet connections be... But don't worry, this will be uploaded on the internet for you to hear and watch after again. But I want you to compare Romans 7, 24 to 8 and 2 with Romans 8, 19 to 21. Romans 7, 24 to 8 and 2, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit and life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Compare that now, 
with Romans 8, 19 to 21. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, <coughs> but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. If we don't experience deliverance by learning why we have the Spirit in us, <coughs> excuse me, we will never see the creature delivered from bondage into our liberty because we're not even enjoying it ourselves. There's a whole work of the cross that Christians, some of them, never enjoy, and that's deliverance from the bondage of sin in their flesh. And if we never enjoy that, we're not going to do anything for this world around us and deliver the creature from the bondage of corruption. We don't have liberty, and how can we liberate them? So this deliverance from bondage has to be realized that it's possible because of our deaths with Jesus. That's how you bring the cross. That's why Paul talked about the cross at the beginning of Romans 6 dying with Jesus, getting baptized into his death so that he could bring us up to this chapter 8 verse 19 victory being led by the spirit of God and setting creatures free chapter 7 describes the chaos that so many Christians are going through I can't get victory, how can I help creation get deliverance if I can't even get victory myself I have no liberty and the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is liberty but you can't enjoy that liberty unless you allow the spirit to do what it's meant to do and that's by presenting yourself to him, saying, I'm alive from the dead. Now use my hands and use my mouth and use my feet. And he'll go to work and start mortifying those deeds of your body. He'll quicken your mortal body. Sin in Romans 6 and 12 won't rule your mortal body. God's spirit in Romans 8 and 11 will quicken your mortal body. Sin's either going to rule in your mortal flesh, your body, or the spirit's going to quicken your mortal body. Compare Romans 6 and 12 with 7, or rather 8 and 11. They go together. So you mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit by presenting yourself to His Spirit. It mortifies the deeds of the body, and then it uses it, your body as its instruments. Praise God. And then you are heralded by the Word of God as a mature child, a huios, a son of God, they that are led by the Spirit like that, who walk after the Spirit like that, they are the mature sons of God that's going to set the creation free that creation is looking for and waiting to manifest. Praise God. It's liberating us. Then the creature awaits that manifestation so it can be delivered into our glorious liberty. The liberty, glorious liberty of the children of God. Can you see now? how the Spirit of God is meant to work in us and improve our behavior. You talk about kingdom living. You took up, talk about Adam being given dominion over the earth, losing it, and Jesus restoring that dominion. We get dominion over our own flesh and we don't even realize it. But if you don't learn these things, God said, my people, my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. My own people. They don't know this. So don't have a lack of knowledge. Take Romans 6. No. Don't let it be know ye not anymore. Let it be I know that I'm alive from the dead. I know I've been baptized. And I know what Romans 8 and 11 really means now. It'll quicken my mortal body so I don't have to obey my flesh with its lusts anymore. And they that are led by the Spirit, by mortifying the deeds of the body, they're the sons of God. Being led by the Spirit, folks, in Romans 8, is seeing the Spirit mortify the deeds of your body. That's what it means to be led by the Spirit. And you are a huios, a mature child of God. Praise God. Hey, Marty, Marty's watching way over in the Philippines. Good seeing Marty here. Oh, my. Thank you, Joanne. That's encouraging. And, and Sister Mitch, some folks that are on there, and there's several others that are here watching. We appreciate you watching this so much. Oh, man, this needs to get out there. Pray, folks, pray. I want something to hit in my ministry where <coughs> this gets out there. It's in my book, Sinless. By the way, if you 
have the book, you want to study it some more. Sometimes the way I preach, I get more into depth than I do in my books, and my books, usually you're supposed to get more in depth than your book. But uh, it is in the book, and let me show you where it is. <clears throat> 